All right, well, aloha nui kako. Hello everybody and thank you for tuning in today for our live question and answer session. Uh, my name is Dr. Steve Mares, but you know, my friends call me Spaceman Steve. I'm the senior scientist at the James Clark Maxwell Telescope. That's that place right behind me. Uh, and I'm situated right here in beautiful Hilo, Hawaii, which is a little bit overcast. I can see out my window today. Uh, today's discussion is called Under the Dome, the stars behind the image. And you know, there are a ton of different people who work at the observatories on Mauna Kea. There are tradespeople, engineers, telescope operators, uh, astronomers, computer scientists, communication experts, uh, and they all work together to produce and share the excellent science that's being done on these islands. And you know, I could never ever do my job as an astronomer without all of these different people. Uh, so today we'll be chatting with some of the folks uh, right here that you see before you. Uh, they work at different observatories. We'll be talking about what they do all day or all night, as the case may be. Uh, you know, the advice that they have for the next generation coming up. And most importantly, they will be answering your questions too. So uh, you can start leaving questions for us in the uh, comments on this YouTube video. And then uh, we will be selecting questions and answering them uh, as a panel. So. Without further ado, allow me to introduce the stars of today's conversation, our panel who are all ready and excited to answer your questions virtually from their homes. So the first is Callie Crowder, and uh, she's an alumni from the University of Hawaii at Hilo, and is currently a remote observer at the Canada-France Hawaii Telescope. As a remote observer, she controls the observatory at night from Waimea, so she's actually driving the thing. And she takes data, grades the viability of it, and ensures the safety of the facility based on those ever-changing conditions in weather on Mauna Kea. Uh, and when she's not working nights, she actually switches to a day schedule, sounds hard, uh, where she helps manage the Canada-France Hawaii Telescope social media accounts. And in her free time, she's an avid baker, always willing to try new recipes too. So welcome, Kelly. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having us on. Oh, we're super glad that you're here to join us. Thank you. And uh, next is Mariella Chalk. Uh, she is the communications officer at the WM Keck Observatory, but you may just know it as Keck. Uh, she brings 20 years of communications experience with her first decade in journalism, working for news stations across the country and here in Hawaii at KHNL Hawaii News Now. Uh, in her current role, Mariella works to share astronomical discoveries made uh, with the media and the public. So she enjoys engineering creativity at the intersection of where science and art meet, which I think is very, very cool and I'm excited to hear more about. Uh, in her free time, uh, she's an adrenaline junkie and some of her most memorable experiences include skydiving, whitewater rafting, and bobsleighing on the world's fastest Olympic track. That is so cool. Welcome, Mariella. Thank you, Spaceman Steve. Happy Aloha Friday. Good to be oh. here. Happy Aloha Friday. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have John Kuroda, who was born and raised here on the Big Island. He grew up in Keao and went to Keao Elementary School and Intermediate School before moving to Waiakea High School. Following graduation from Waiakea, he attended uh, Hawaii Community College under the Electronics Technology Program. And using his degree in electronics technology, he worked for a variety of observatories on the Big Island. And these include NASA's Infrared Telescope Facility, the Institute for Astronomy, the Gemini Project, the Joint Astronomy Center, the Smithsonian Submillimeter Array, and the Yuan Tse Li Array, which was previously called Amoeba. Wow. And currently, John is attending the University of Hawaii at Hilo, and he's working towards a double major in both computer science and mathematics to pursue a new and a challenging career. And if he wasn't busy enough, he is also a software engineer at the East Asian Observatory, or the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, where I work. You might catch John in his free time riding his sport bike or his supermoto around Hilo, so throw him a shaka if you do. Uh, welcome, John. Uh, thank you, Steve. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here, everybody. And um, while the first set of questions start to come in from our audience, uh, you can start asking questions in the YouTube comments on this video here. While the first questions start to come in, let's, uh, let's grab a little bit of context and let, let's delve into a little bit more about what each of you do. So going around the panel, very briefly, could you just describe what a normal workday looks like for you? Um, Callie, would you like to start? Sure. So my work days can vary from night shifts to day shifts, uh, depending on when I'm on. So uh, night shift is me waking up at four in the afternoon, uh, getting into work to open the dome by maybe 530. And I'll be up all night taking data um, and won't go to bed until maybe seven in the morning, depending on how the night goes. So I'm the only one away controlling the telescope all night during that time. Wow, D dinner at uh, 7 a.m. and breakfast at 5 p.m., is that what you <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. You have to completely switch your whole uh, internal body clock uh, between day and night shifts. Gosh, that's so cool. And the telescope is actually controlled from Waimea. Correct, so all the observing that I do is from Waimea, but we're controlling the observatory that's on the top of Mauna Kea. That, 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 that's absolutely fantastic. That sounds like such a fun job. That's so cool. Um, <laughs> next, uh, Mariella, how about you? Uh, what does a normal work day look like for you? I don't know if I can say I have a normal work day, um, which is what I love about my job. There's just so much variety. One moment I'm writing press releases, the next moment I'm managing our social media accounts, um, the next moment I'm interviewing someone um, or designing a poster, writing radio spots. I mean, there's a whole gamut of uh, communications channels that I get to play with. Um, but if I were to put it in a nutshell, I'd say that my work revolves around strategy and content creation. And the joy of content creation is that um, whether it be print or digital or in person, there's just so many uh, aspects of it. It's multifaceted. So it's a creative playground that I get to play in every day and every day is different. That sounds like loads of a creative playground. This is, it kind of sounds like the lottery of a job. I'm, uh, that, that's really great. I think all of these jobs here actually have quite a bit of variety in them too, right? So it keeps us, uh, keeps us definitely on our toes from day to day. And I think it's a lot of fun. And that's fantastic to have all of these different communications. I mean, you're a well-known person around here and in our communities and everything. And we oh, thank you so much for the work that you do. <laughs> that's really sweet, Steve, but <laughs> I don't know about that, but thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, John, what does a work day look like for you? Um, mostly I sit in front of a computer, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I'll, I'll take a look at, you know, emails in the morning, mainly to look at um, any faults that happen at night. So the telescope will, you know, typically run relatively well, but there'll be um, bugs and uh, software problems and that occur. So I'll take a look at those, see how those are doing. If I have anything to say about them or look at them, I will. Um, other than that, you know, I have projects on the side that I work on programs, uh, some programs to write or papers to read about, um, and, you know, improving existing instrumentation. So it, it kind of goes between, you know, fixing things and uh, creating, creating programs and stuff like that, yeah. Wow. So to be able to create and to fix things. So you're saying that these telescopes aren't always, you know, perfectly well behaved and you fix them when they start doing backflips or something like that. Is that? Yeah. 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 Fortunately, they're not working perfectly all the time. And <laughs> for me, at least it gives me a job. Yeah. Yeah. That's called job security right there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's really fantastic. Yeah, and with such a background in all of these different telescopes, too, I think that's really cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we have a question coming in uh, from Harriet and Waimea. Uh, what other jobs and careers are important at the telescopes? That's, I mean, it's, it's such a huge question. What other jobs and careers? John, I might go back to you because you have so much experience at these different telescopes uh, and you've seen, you know, like the different crews that go up during the day and kind of how it works at night. Um, could you give us a, an overview of some of the different types of jobs or careers that might be? At yeah, time? sure, sure. Um, I think maybe I'll, I'll uh, kind of explain briefly like how a telescope uh, maybe operates uh, just, you know, for those that maybe don't uh, are unsure a little bit of it. So, and I'll explain all the systems that go into it. So, you know, we at JCMT, at least we have a, you know, a big 
satellite dish basically and it you know it collects you know it, we look at stuff in the sky and it all you know radio frequencies or, or light you know energy comes from the sky and we look at it and it bounces through mirrors which have electronics uh, so we need electrical electronic crew um, engineers technicians to work on that and those and that uh, gets sent to instruments inside of our cabin and those instruments some of them are basically cameras fancy cameras that are refrigerated so we need staff to that are experts in cryogenic and refrigeration because i'm not um so we yeah, need, well, actually, we uh, need if, if it's okay if i can just say for instance the jcmt this telescope pictured behind me here where both john and i work has an instrument that's cooled down to negative 454 degrees fahrenheit which is pretty close to absolute zero. So when uh, when John says fancy cameras, there's some pretty fancy cameras to take pictures of space stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they they they're complex, right? They mean they need a lot of crew to work on them because no one's an expert in all of the fields, right? So so we need we need experts for everything, and some of those other cameras are like um, more like radios, right? In a in a car, like a tuner in a car stereo. So we listen to you know they're, they're, you tune it to radio stations. And you know, you listen to what it what it what it sounds like essentially, and and so some of our instruments are like that. And there's all this equipment um, that's all controlled through motors, uh, electronic. The telescope itself, you know, it's this big massive thing. It has a lot of bearings, um, a lot of gearboxes, uh, mechanical components, and you know, it's like an amusement park. It's it's <laughs> you know a lot going on. You can't ride anything. But uh, so, you know, there's there's mechanical crew to maintain all of that um, mechanical structure and, and, and moving parts. And we have, you know, you need welders, you need um, refrigeration people, uh, you need software people like myself. Uh, you also need, you know, all the all the other um, human resources to 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 maintain, you know, a place that, you know, can have between 30 and, you know, 200 people depending on on the telescope so there's a lot of paperwork and administration to be done. yeah there there's a lot so, yeah, so there's I a mean, lot of jobs yeah this is a fantastic overview because you know i think a lot of people when they see like telescopes and science institutions they're like oh you know i'd have to go to school for 30 years and get two phds to work there but no like going to the trades there's a there's a whole bunch of uh, a whole variety a spectrum of of careers across these places and all of these gears fit together to make it, these beautiful institutions do what they do which I think is really yeah, good. I, yeah, and, and one last thing, you know, a, a lot of the day crew I worked with, you know, they, they were all, you know, I was surprised that, you know, they're all from HCC. You know, at the time when I got a job, it was like, hey, you know, that's kind of neat. I, I wasn't expecting that, but there, there's a lot of them all from the welding or a machine shop, diesel, electronics, you know, it's, it's, it's a big, wide variety. That's the thing, right? Yeah, that, that's the uh, uh, Hawaii Technical College, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Hawaii yes. Community College. That's, that's absolutely fantastic. You know, and we have another question coming in right now. I mean, clearly we're all virtually meeting here. We're not, you know, together. Uh, you know, a lot of the observatories know we, we work together as, you know, sort of happy ohana. But uh, the question comes in from Sonia from uh, Hawaii Island. So right now, COVID is a real issue for people around the world, right? We've all been impacted by it. I know I've significantly been impacted by it personally. Uh, so what are we doing or what is your observatory doing to ensure the safety of staff at your observatory and that, that's that's a really really good question i think that we're mostly doing the same things but uh mariella are you able to answer that question for us sure um so a majority of us are working from home we're working remotely um we do have a uh, scaled back uh, operations in terms of summit crews who go up to our telescope facility on Mauna Kea to take care of the critical instrumentation up there um, and also to prepare the telescopes for um, the astronomers who observe at night. Um, even our astronomers who are observing at night, um, you know, we have astronomers in our scientific community that are all over uh, the United States um, and so all of them are what we're, uh, we're what we call pajama mode observing. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Where they're uh, observing from home or, or they're observing remotely. So um, in doing that, we are practicing social distancing. So fortunately, we have the capacity and capabilities to be able to do the work remotely. And um, because of that inherent or inherent in that is the safety aspect and making sure that we are all um, practicing um, safety protocols when it comes to COVID. 
Yeah, I certainly know. Yeah, nobody's been in our office for, for quite a while or only a couple of people have and social distancing is everywhere. We wipe down every single surface that we touch. Masks are required and, and all of these all of these things, whether whether you know, you're know you working at the facility or here at the, the base office. But it's nice to be able to work from home in, in these environments too. And through the power of technology, they even have this conversation with all of you today, which is a lot of fun. Thanks for the question, yeah. And uh, we have a question coming in from uh, a Sky in, in Kalapana. Uh, so it looks like Sky is not so old yet. Uh, how can she work up there one day when she is older? So Kelly, if Sky wanted to be a telescope operator, a remote observer up on Mauna Kea, uh, what, what advice would you give to her? What would she have to do? Um so for me, I had to get a degree in astronomy or a related field to become an observer. And I believe all the other observers need to have a degree in something like astronomy or to at least understand what we're looking at. Um, but really, you just have to, if you have a passion for it, push through and, you know, uh, keep working towards that degree. I think all of us in my graduating class at some point thought about dropping out um, because it is a difficult degree. But once you get past a certain stage, it's not as hard. And if you really have a passion for it, you'll regret dropping out. And even I, I thought about switching to business, I think in my sophomore year of college, um, I just didn't know when to stop. So I just continued doing it. And now I'm a telescope operator. Uh, so really just, if you have a passion, work towards it. And that goes for any degree you have. That's really, really great advice. And yeah, thanks for being so genuine about like, you know, yeah, so, some of these degrees are really hard and you'll have second thoughts. And if you want to go, but you know, yeah, your living example of, you know, a passion for something can can really bring you to great places. And, and it's really, really fantastic to see all of this stuff coming in from space, to be right at the forefront of all of this research happening. Uh, I mean, Mauna Kea is, you know, the single most important site, I think, for astronomy all over the world. So the impact that we have with research just goes to a wide variety of countries and everywhere and sort of lifts us all up in a way. And I, I think that's really fantastic. Well, you said it perfectly. Why I became an observer was to be on the front lines of astronomy. And that's what my passion is, is seeing that come out and being able to contribute to that in some way. I had second thoughts in my career too, but yeah, it sounds like we had a similar um, you know, there's just a quick question that came in too. What is the most interesting object that you've personally observed? Uh, and, and, and what distance was it at? I mean, you've probably observed a lot of stuff, but can, do you have something off the top of your head? Uh, my personal favorite was I got to help observe a Muamua, which is the interstellar object that came through our solar system. And it was the first interstellar object that we had ever seen come through. So we work with pan stars over uh, on Maui. And so they see all kinds of essentially comets coming through our solar system and they send it over to CFHT to reobserve. That's one of the things that we observed. And I didn't necessarily know what I was observing at the time. Uh, it was just kind of labeled as a high priority target. And I was communicating with that astronomer back and forth for a good four hours that night as we were observing it. And then once I realized, it, it was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing that I got to be a part of that. So this was a fairly close object that was within our solar system, but it's something that we'll never see again. So it was pretty cool. That's great. Yeah, because most people, you know, when they think about astronomy, they might think about things far away or extra galactic and millions of millions. Yeah, but yeah, this was a rock that visited our own solar system from somewhere that we don't know. And it was like this beautiful mystery. And oh, that is, I, I wish I was a part of that. That sounds really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so let me see here. There's uh, a couple of other questions coming in. Uh, Mariella, how would you see astronomy playing a role in diversifying the economy in Hawaii? Now, that's a very important issue that's, that's, you know, that's probably going to take hours and hours to unpack. But do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, because it's something that's on the forefront of people's minds with mayoral elections coming up and everything, too. So how, uh, how astronomy could play a role in diversifying the economy? Well, I think the job opportunities, number one, um, the workforce alone that the Mauna Kea observatories off, um, that the Mauna Kea observatories 
have um, is a way of diversifying our local economy. Um, when you're talking about jobs at the at the observatories, you know, any just like any other organization, you you have like a finance department, an HR department, administrative department. We have engineers, technicians, and electricians um, that are needed to run the organization. So a lot of people think that um, the job to get a job at an observatory, you have to have um, some kind of science background. But in reality, for example, at CAC, we only have a handful of um, astronomers and the rest are uh, running the operations. So that's one way of diversifying the economy is just simply the jobs that are offered at the observatories. Um, there's also the domino effect of, um, so for example, of, of running an observatory. Um, we, for example, at Keck, a lot, a lot of our vendors, I think um, at last count we had maybe over a hundred to almost 200 local vendors that we work with directly. Um, so that's another way that you kind of see that ripple effect of just having an observatory um, on the island. Um, and then let's see, the third way to diversify the econ that uh, astronomy can diversify the economy is, oh, well, through education, you know, because so we can serve as an education and workforce pipeline to um, jobs in STEM, and it doesn't have to be with, within the observatories, it could be within a STEM field. And as you know, on Hawaii, there's a, a whole lot of STEM opportunities here. So um, we do a lot of STEM outreach. The Mauna Kea observatories have uh, an organization called, or a subcommittee called the MCAUC. And I think it's Mauna Kea Astronomy, M-K-A-O, <laughs> outreach. outreach. We love acronyms in astronomy and I, you know, we know the acronym, but we don't necessarily, what they all, don't necessarily know what they stand for. But we have um, a committee dedicated to STEM outreach and education so that when you're talking about the next generation who um, may be interested in, in science or math or um, any STEM field, we can serve as sort of um, the platform by which they can uh, further further their knowledge of um, what kind of uh, further their knowledge and career pathways that they may be able that may be available to them. Yeah, those all really valuable points. I mean, we're uh, the Big Island is a small island. You know, we all know each other. We're plugged into the community, and and the better education resources that we have for you know people who are interested in science and technology and engineering and math. Uh, to stay on the island and stay at home and be able to do these careers, I think is really fantastic. Yeah, thanks very much for that. That was very insightful. Um, oh, here's a practical question coming in from somebody named Matteo. In normal non-COVID times, you know, uh, the, the normal times, if you remember them, um, is it possible to visit an observatory and what can visitors do there? Um, John, do you know anything uh, about visiting uh, different observatories or? Uh, not a huge amount, but I do know, um, you can get in touch with them and, and I've, you know, I've given tours and I've been on other tours. Um, I am not the, the tour person, but, but they, they, they were set up before all this COVID stuff, of course, again, and, and, you know, it would be a pretty personalized tour, you know, so concernedly it's, it's definitely possible. I've been in most of the telescopes, uh, just you know, not as an employee of another telescope, but just, you know, someone just wanting to check it out. Yeah. 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 There, there's actually this, uh, oh, Kelly, do you have? Yeah. I was going to say, if I can jump in real fast. So there's the Mauna Kea experience tours for people who live in Hawaii that under non COVID times, um, happens once a month. And I think it's about 48 people who can put in reservations completely for free. Uh, you don't pay anything. You just have to get up to the 9,000 foot level where the visitor station is. Um, and I'm sure we'll start that right back up again once uh, COVID is over. But you get, uh, you'd get, you be able to go into two observatories, tour around the facility, and they take you back down again. They can answer all your questions there as well. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, I believe it's called the Kama Aina Observatory Experience. So if you're Kama Aina, if you have a Hawaii resident card or a driver's license, state ID like that, uh, it's totally free for you. Yeah, uh, you just go up there and they'll even give you lunch. And uh, yeah, so uh, I've led a couple of those tours before. They're loads of fun. Yeah, we love to show off what we're doing. Uh, we love talking about it all the time. So in non-COVID times, there are certainly uh, options available for everybody. Yeah to go check and it out. If I, if I could add and jump in as well. So at Keck, um, our headquarters is down in Waimea. It's not on Mauna Kea, but we do have a visitor center 
Um, and, it, and it's manned by um, some what we call guide stars. So are their docents. And so it's open, it's well, before COVID, it was open between 10 to I believe two o'clock. So you can just come right in and pass by, drop by, talk to our guide stars, stars and um, see our headquarters and learn more about what we do. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, we're, we're super nice people. Yeah, you know, if you just like uh, go onto our website too, everybody has, you know, people who are in outreach and education and, you know, drop us a line sometime. You can email me directly too. Uh, I can put my contact information out there. I'd love to chat with anybody too uh, uh, about any of this stuff. It's, it's, it's all super fun to us. So <laughs> let me check for some more questions coming in here. Indeed. Um, so instrumentation, so the cameras and all of the backend technology and everything like that, uh, is very crucial, obviously, uh, for the telescopes, uh, for all the telescopes. You know, the, the most recent technology so we can see the furthest and, and, and the, get the best images that we possibly can. Um, can we comment on any of the recent advances in this field? So, John, you work pretty closely with some of the instrumentation. And I know that the observatory that we work at is, a, is more of like a radio telescope, so it works a little bit differently. Um, can you comment on a couple of the recent advances here? Um, well, one of, one of them is uh, SCUBA 2. So that, you know, I guess I say that's recent-ish. Um, you know, it, it's, it's like you said, it gets very cold. And, um, you know, doing that's not easy. I mean, that's not necessarily a new technology. Um, but the, the sensors in it, you know, are, are relatively new. Um, and, and it comes with its own set of issues being so new, uh, but the bolometers in there, you know, they're, they're pretty sensitive and, and we have a, a lot of them compared to the older version. So you said, uh, you said a word there, bolometer, what is that? Oh, yes. They're like a <laughs> thermometer. I guess they sense temperature. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's like a fancy yeah. thermometer. Yeah, it's like a fancy thermometer. Yeah. So, cool. so we use that to, uh, you know, view things cold, cold things in space, you know? Yeah, that, that's personally what our telescope is really good at. Uh, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope is looking at cold dust and forming stars and the furthest galaxies that we've observed uh, as humans, which I think is really cool. Um, from the other perspectives, because our telescope is a little bit different than other ones, because we use these different tools to get different perspectives and looks at the universe. So all the telescopes on Mauna Kea use different technology to see different things. And we all work together to get uh, a, a whole big picture, right? It, it's like if we only had one telescope, it'd be like trying to fix a car, but all you have is a hammer. Uh, you, you need other tools to, to actually get the job done, right? Which is why there's multiple observatories. So uh, Mariella, do you know of some recent advances at Keck? Yes, well, uh, we do have, we're constantly trying to advance our instrumentation at Keck, and I'm sure it's the same for all observatories because a telescope, um, so the power of seeing the farthest or even um, objects that are close to us but are very, very faint is not just in the telescope, um, but it's really, a lot of it is really on the instrumentation. Um, and so one of the things that, one of the instruments that we are working on bringing online is called the Keck Planet Finder. And um, I don't know if how, how uh, if you've been reading the news lately, exoplanets are a hot thing. <laughs> and so, um, ex and exoplanets are planets that are um, in other solar systems beyond um, our own. And so now there's this huge quest to find Earth-like exoplanets. And of course, finding an Earth-like exoplanet could open up the possibility of um, perhaps life, microbial life live, um, on that planet. So there's this huge push to really um, advance instrumentation um, in order to search for uh, these types of exoplanets. And the Keck Planet Finder, um, which is not online yet, but we are working on it, is one of the ways that we're advancing um, that field of astronomy. That's amazing. And you're going to let us know when you find a, another Earth out there, right? <laughs> oh, we will share that with the world for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool that we're living in an era where that's even a possibility. Even 10, 15 years ago, that, that, that was so, so difficult to even imagine. And uh, Callie, I mean, you're driving this telescope. You're taking data all the time with the instruments on the back. Uh, can you comment on anything happening at Canada, France, Hawaii? Oh, uh, so I don't know the specifics of anything, but I know that our technical and instrumentation staff are constantly improving our instruments. Um, 
going right inside of them, you know, shimming things so that, you know, the mirrors and the cameras are at different angles, um, straighter angles, so maybe we get a better focus. Um, so there's constant improvements being made all the time, even once it's done once and they're like, all right, how can we improve that again? Even if it's maybe a year down the line that we'll get to it, but. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of this is, you know, like long-term projects too, and, and, and people coming in and it's really pushing the forefront of, of what's possible technologically, which is why John wakes up in the morning sometimes with a bunch of bug reports and errors and things that went wrong because, you know, we're building this stuff as we go and trying to figure it out, which. Yeah. I think and really I should mention, uh, we also have a new instrument, uh, Namakanui. I should just mention mm -hmm. that it's a radio, radio receiver. So, you know, that, that's, that's, brand new and a lot of people are putting a lot of work into that too so yeah yeah there's a big team both commissioning it yeah. and then astronomers wanting to use it and 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 it's you know it's already getting some some fun data and science coming in yeah. uh that yeah we'll be hearing about you know in the coming weeks and months uh now that our new receiver is operational which is really cool uh so there's a couple of other questions coming in here let me just see um there is so there's there's a note um on there so what is the future? Let me just see. We kind of covered that one a little bit. So I'm going to try to find a different one. Um, so there's another question from Sky and Kalapana. Um, so Cal, you, you noted the uh, extra solar system rocky visitor that we had. Uh, but there's a question. What is the what is the weirdest thing that you've ever seen? Like, like uh, do you see aliens up there when you're there? Or what's the, <laughs> Well, so when I'm observing, we're taking images and we might have an exposure that takes 30 minutes to, uh, well, sorry, 30 minutes is the long part, uh, maybe like a minute to 30 minutes or so uh, to take a single exposure. So we rarely see weird things going through the telescope because they go by pretty quickly. Um, if I see something weird in the images, it's actually usually because of our CCD cameras might have an issue or um, there's something on the actual camera itself that is getting in the way. So I've never seen an alien myself. Uh, I, I don't necessarily know if I believe aliens have visited the Earth. However, they definitely exist. Our universe is just too big to not have other life forms somewhere in the universe. <laughs> That's, that's a fantastic perspective. I mean, uh, it, it's not my original answer, but I heard it somewhere else, you know, like usually when people say a UFO an unidentified flying object, we, we should stop right there because it's unidentified and we, we really Absolutely. can't say anything about yeah, that. Yeah, we see things, unidentified objects all the time in the telescopes. They're just <laughs> not necessarily life forms. <laughs> fantastic. That's really, really good. Uh, so I have another question here. Uh, this one's for all the panelists, and I think it'll be good to, uh, you know, kind of hash out a little bit. Um, the question is, how did you start to train um, for your current job? Like, what courses did you study, it's like, specifically to actually have the job that you are? Uh, maybe it's somebody graduating high school right now or going into college or rethinking a career, you know, looking for a way forward. So, um, Mariella, what sort of courses did you take? How did you get to be uh, at Mauna Kea, where you are now? Well, when you're talking about being a communications officer for any observatory um, or even doing outreach, I, you know, there's a conventional route and I would fall in the unconventional <laughs> side of things. So I'll give you, a, so for me, uh, my degree is in journalism. And so the first, um, the first half of, or the first decade is in my career, it was spent in news. Um, and then, you know, in the second half, I made a career shift. And in journalism, the natural uh, career shift that um, a lot of journalists take is to go into PR or marketing and whatnot. And so for me, when I decided to make that um, shift, I wanted to make sure to be represent, to be able to represent an organization that I personally am passionate about because, um, you know, you want to, if you're representing an organization, you want to be authentically passionate about sharing the stories of the organization. And for me, you know, I've been in love with the universe for as long as I can remember. And so when I um, moved to Hawaii, Hawaii Island, I already knew um, about the 
um, astronomy and aerospace industry on the island. So I told myself, okay, you know, in my next career chapter, I want to um, work in communications for um, a, an observatory, for an observatory or an airspace agency, which is what I did when I was on Hawaii Island. I um, was originally a public, I started out as a public information officer for an aerospace agency called Pisces in Hilo. Um, and the, and I actually, I live in Waimea and I would drive by Keck Observatory all the time. And I thought, oh, Keck Observatory would be a dream, but I didn't think that I could, would actually qualify because I don't have a science degree. I have a journalism degree, but um, in the end it worked out and here I am. So I feel really grateful that I was able to um, land this job um, and, and serve as the storyteller, if you will, for, for this amazing organization. Um, but when you're talking about a con the conventional route, I know from the colleagues that I work with, um, um, so, so let me backtrack first. So Keck Observatory is owned and operated by the University of California and Caltech. And so um, there, in each of those uh, universities and colleges, they each have communications officers as well, or public, um, I, there's different titles for it. There's public information officer, public affairs officer, et cetera, et cetera. But um, for, for many of my communications colleagues, what they did is they actually um, have a degree in astronomy um, an undergraduate degree in astronomy. And so rather than moving on to get a PhD in astronomy to uh, be a professional astronomer, um, they take that degree and go into outreach. So whether that be planetarium work, museum work, um, education outreach, education and public outreach or communications or science writing, um, that would probably be the most conventional way of getting to the role that I but if you're a writer, I think, and if you have a passion for something, you know, don't let the conventional route be a barrier. As long as you love what you do and you work hard and you get, you know, you educate yourself. Like I took a class at UH Hilo just to deepen my, and further my understanding of astronomy. It was an astronomy 101 class. Um, it makes the job easier too <laughs> when you have Absolutely. that understanding of what you're communicating yeah. about. So um, that's, that's really, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's really, really fantastic advice. You know, if you don't have a hardcore science background and everything, and uh, I mean, there, there are other ways uh, into the community. And, and uh, so it's, it's not all just for scientists. There are many, many different types of backgrounds and people who work for the observatory. So that's really encouraging. Thanks so much. Uh, Callie, where'd you, uh, what, what was the route that you took? Like, what courses did you take? What should they focus on to be? So I, uh, I knew I wanted to go into astronomy. Um, once I was in high school and realized that it was a career and wasn't just, you know, a hobby people in their, do in their backyard. So once I realized that, uh, it was actually my mom who was like, you know, like, you want to go into astronomy, you should probably go and study at where Mauna Kea is, because it's the best site in the world for astronomy. And I was like, oh, yeah, uh, in Hawaii, great. And so I moved to Hawaii for college. Um, I got my degrees in both astronomy and physics from UH Hilo. During that entire time, I was working on uh, Mauna Kea at the visitor station. So describing uh, what we were looking at in the telescopes to the public who came up. Uh, so I took a much more conventional route that uh, from college working uh, in an astronomy type place through college and then right after I graduated, this position ended up opening up and uh, happily I fit into it, so. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, just go after it and get it done. <laughs> that's yeah, excellent. Yeah. Some people it's less traditional way or it might take a few years longer uh, and that's perfectly okay as well. What I hear from both of you so far is that passion was a key ingredient in this, what you're passionate about and what you really wanna do and be genuine in your job, which is great. Yeah. And yeah. And John, we, we heard a little bit in your introduction, but for people just joining us maybe and everything, do you want to give us just a, a little bit of your roots to uh, all these different observatories, maybe just in brief? Because I guess you have a long history of them, yeah? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I guess some courses that, that you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I think that was a, a difference for me. I, I had no idea in high school. You know, I wasn't I wasn't very good at school, I guess. I was <laughs> pretty pretty bad at it in high school. And, and, and earlier, you know, um, but, you know, I did like electronics at the time and in high school, I, you know, I took, a, I took an electronics class, um, you know, YK had one, 
Um, but I was, I was doing it at home as well. Uh, I also took a programming class that was, that was offered. So I dabbled in that. And, you know, that, you know, not knowing what to do and, you know, having a connection with my teachers, you know, they, they said, hey, why don't you go to HCC? Um, because, you know, at the time that seemed the best option for me. So I did that. I went to HCC uh, into electronics. I was debating between auto mechanics and electronics, uh, but I ended up going to uh, electronics and, and uh, you know, I took, you know, analog circuits, digital circuits and fabrication and, you know, all those are, are all needed. They're, they're good. You know, you learn how to work with your hands and build things. And so that was my initial path. And that was, you know, from high school, just to HCC. And then I got a job, you know, at, at the observatories. You know, I started as a student at IRTF and IFA. And in fact, I got a job. One of my jobs at IFA was um, Institute for Astronomy was a machine shop assistant because I like playing around with milling machines and things like that. So so I, I did a lot of things like that um, and I worked for a while and I decided to go back to school. So, um, because, you know, I learning, you know, I, I enjoyed the challenging and, and learning and everything. And I, and I did, did well with uh, my degree, uh, but I went back and uh, I wanted to do computer science. So, um, so I did that, but, and, you know, take all their courses, data structures, I, I, I think actually that book back there's a data structures book. I don't, yeah. And, you know, math, math is important. So, so I took a lot of math courses and a lot of computer science courses, programming, um, you know, all, all learning to problem solve uh, really uh, for, for any, pretty much any STEM, you know, job or, or a lot of any job in general. Um, you know, I, uh, computer science is like the, the study of, um, uh, solving problems using a computer and I like solving problems. So I thought, Hey, you know, uh, I want to get into that field. So that eventually combined with my electronics degree, you know, it, it gave me a good home, you know, at JCMT where we, you know, I, I have to write programs and read them, but also there's this close connection to the hardware. And so combined, I, I think that that's what helped me, all the classes helped me get there. Yeah, now that's really fantastic. I mean, between machine shop working, problem solving, critical thinking, John is the guy that you want on the deserted island with you. Uh, and he can also fix your computer too. Uh, if you're not on a deserted island, I think that's, that's a really awesome background. That's really, really cool. Very, that's amazing. And you know, yeah, just, just maybe like very, very quickly, if it's even possible, but very quickly in one sentence or two sentence, let's go in reverse order. What's the favorite part of your job? What is your favorite part of your job, John? Um, I, I like, um, running programs that work the first time that <laughs> that's rare, but it's, I get a kick out of it. Writing yeah. code that works. That's yeah. Cool. I also like watching the roof and doors open at JCMT. It's like these two gigantic, you know, 80 foot doors and they open and I just like watching it. It's kind Seeing of weird, all the work but... that went into that. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Kelly, how about you? Do you like watching the roof and doors? Oh, I mean, who doesn't like watching the observatories open? That's always, it's such a feat for these very heavy uh, doors on these observatories to open and then the telescope itself moving. But for me, my favorite part is when we get a night of beautiful weather, pristine weather, uh, great scene. So the stars aren't moving around a lot. They won't be twinkling in the sky. I'm not twinkling, yeah. yeah. No twinkling in the stars and you're just, moving through uh, all the programs that you have to work on with pristine data. They all get the best possible grade. And it's just really, uh, at the end of the night, you're just really content with how the night went and you're happy that all of these astronomers got all this great data that you're responsible for. So that's, that's my favorite part. That's, that's, that's really, really fantastic. Cause I know that you, I mean, my colleagues, you definitely make a lot of astronomers happy in the morning when they wake up with their coffee and they go, yes, we got data. So yeah. that's really exciting. Definitely. And Mariella, how about you? What's your favorite part of your job? Hmm. There's so many. 
Um, I would say that my favorite part of my job, my favorite part of the job is to do special projects. I've been really fortunate at Keck in that um, I'm allowed quite a bit of creative freedom and flexibility. So um, one of the things that um, that I've been able to work on is uh, our, our uh, documentaries. In fact, I've done two now, and I never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that I'd ever dabble into filmmaking. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, one of the things that I've been able to do is actually produce two short films about Keck, which has been amazing. Um, and also um, one of the other special projects I've done is called an exoplanet Imaginarium. Can you tell that I'm just fascinated by exoplanets? <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, and so what we did was we took um, exoplanets that were either characterized or um, discovered by Keck. We picked maybe like 12 of them and I worked with an exoplanet artist, paired them up with um, one of our staff astronomers because we wanted these images and, and, we, and they uh, created images like, and these images were very realistic. They're not like Photoshop or CGI, they're actual models. So they're, you know, the Adam Makarenko is his name, the exoplanet artist, he takes like these tennis ball size like foam balls and he you know at, you know twists cotton to make a store to make a storm <laughs> and, and it was but you know the great part about it is we really really tried hard to make them as scientifically realistic as possible and so what our staff astronomer Carlos Alvarez did was he would take the published scientific paper for the exoplanet and translate that data whether it be the radial velocity the distance to its star etc cetera, etc cetera, and um, translate that for Adam so that he can uh, then translate it into our and so um, we call it the Keck Observatory Exoplanet Imaginary Men. We produced about 12 images um, and made a calendar out of them. <laughs> so, that is so cool. Yeah, I mean, it was I mean, a lot of fun. Really, I mean, I'm just enamored. Somebody who really appreciates art and, of course, science, uh, just seeing the intersection of these two things coming together is amazing. Uh, maybe we can have on the chat uh, that link come up to anybody who wants to go to the uh, Exoplanet Imaginary Men because it's, it's on a public website, right? Yes, yes, it's right on our website and I can certainly share that on our chat. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, and if you have other questions, please, please uh, leave them in the YouTube comments here. We would love to answer your questions. Uh, Marielle, I might stick with you for a little bit here. Um, there was a question that came in uh, about the 30 meter telescope. You guys might know it as the TMT. Um, uh, just a note, none of us work for the TMT and we're not associated with the project. So um, we certainly wouldn't want to speak for them or, or, or you know, anything like that. Um, but uh, the question, Mariella, uh, I assume that you're most up on the news uh, <laughs> in the actual newspapers uh, out of any of us. Um, how do you, uh, and other people can chime in if you want to, uh, but how does, how, how do you feel about the, the news that apparently broke yesterday that it may be three years until 30 meter telescope begins construction? Because it, it's a very important issue in the community. It would take hours and hours and hours to unpack even a small part of this ongoing discussion. And I know in, in a forum like this, it's very, very difficult to you know, really give appreciation to all of these different dimensions of why this is such a significant conversation. But just with the news going forward about, you know, three years until TMT begins construction. Again, none of us have anything really to do with TMT, but uh, do you want to make a comment on, on how you feel about that news or? Sure. Well, I think um, the delay is reflective of very, very deep issues surrounding Mauna Kea and not just TMT. Um, to me, I think that, you know, while three years is a long time, um, it is also an opportunity for for our community um, to talk and listen to each other um, and really try to understand um, some of the very deep rooted and understandably intense and emotional issues surrounding the 30 meter, te 30 meter telescope and not just the 30 meter telescope, but what, um, what, how we see Mauna Kea um, and what kind of future would we want for Mauna Kea? Um, I think that, you know, there, the issues tend to be broadcast as black and white, but the issues are very nuanced. Um, I've heard a whole gradient and kaleidoscope of, um, of thoughts and opinions and beliefs about the issues. And so um, I think perhaps this is an opportunity to reflect, to reflect and see how we might uh, first heal the community and how we might just really talk to each other and listen. 
And I think it's in that gray area, like when I'm talking about the black and white, um, I think it's in the gray area that we might find um, some mutual understanding and respect on all sides of the issue. Yeah, that's, that's really, really valuable. That's a really, really valuable comment. You know, yeah, because on, on all sides of the issue, yeah, these things are very, very deep seated and, and, and it's important to, to have listening and understanding across, across all sides. That's excellent. All right, well, um, there's a couple of other things coming in, a couple of other questions coming in for people. Um, let me just see here. Oh, there's one here for, uh, for Callie, I think. Callie, I think that this is a good question for you. Uh, this comes in from uh, somebody named Steven. Excellent name, I have to say right off the bat. Thank you very much for commenting. Uh, how much interference is actually created by cars driving around on the summit after dark? You know, of, of course, you know, uh, in normal times, you know, anybody can go to the mountain and um, would it help if parking lights only were used at night or are like real restrictions on headlights necessary in, in your telescope? Uh, so there's a couple different things to unpack with that. So cars driving around on the summit of Mauna Kea can be difficult to deal with because astronomy is a study of light right? And we're studying light that's traveled millions to billions of years to get to our telescopes. So if you have light right next to your telescope that's shining into your dome that's getting in the way of the light that's traveled so long to get to us, it's finally getting to the telescope. So uh, it is difficult to deal with that. And sometimes you can try to look at a different part of the sky to deflect that light, but then maybe a target that you've been looking at for a half hour is going to be ruined because of that car's headlights. The worst though is when people who don't know go up there and they, you know, they see these telescopes at night and they're all open and the vents are open and it's a very cool sight. But the problem is that they'll sit there with their lights shining directly at the dome as it's open and observing because they don't realize how bad that's interfering. Um, so if people are going up to the summit of Mauna Kea, I'd say um, keep your lights down or even don't go up at night. Sunset, best time to be up at the summit of Mauna Kea because you get a beautiful sunset view. But once it gets dark out, you're actually losing a lot of what you think you'll see. So you think you'll get this beautiful night sky at 13,796 feet above sea level. And that's actually not true because of the lack of oxygen. There's 40%, sorry, you observe, absorb 40% less oxygen up at the summit of Mauna Kea than you do down at sea level. So your eyes actually aren't functioning as well. So if you want to go and see the night sky, it's actually best to do down at the 9,000 foot level where the uh, visitor station is. And your eyes are going to function better. And the number of stars you'll see out there is going to blow your mind. If you have a moonless, a cloudless night, it's better than any other place in the world to see with the naked eye. Yeah, that's that's really fantastic. So thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, if you're planning on visiting in normal times again, when, when the world gets back to normal, yeah, stop by the visitor center, hear what they have to say, hear, hear, make sure that you know all the safety protocols going up too. I mean, like you say, it's a very high site low oxygen. Yeah, definitely know what you're getting into if you're going to be visiting the summit of Mauna Kea. That's, that's really important. Uh, there's a couple of more, a uh, couple of fun ones coming in. Uh, so, uh, ooh, what, oh, what one do, what one should I pick? Uh, let me see here. So what kind of stuff do you do, like to do outside of work? I mean, like, honestly, we, we live in what I believe to be one of the most beautiful places in the world. You just mentioned sunset on Mauna Kea. I am comfortable enough to admit that the first time I saw it, I cried. I literally cried. It is such a special place. I, 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 can't, even, I can't even describe to you. Uh, but here in uh, like around Hilo or around Waimea, the islands in general, what kind of stuff do you do for fun? I know, John, in your intro, we mentioned things like motorbikes and sport bikes and everything like that. What kind of stuff keeps you having fun in Hawaii? Yeah, um, you know, I, that's, you know, I ride, uh, well, I don't, first of all, like right now, well, most of the time when there's school, I really don't have much fun. Uh, it's usually just, you know, homework and stuff, but outside, yeah, I like ride, I have a scooter. It's in the picture right there. It's this little electric 
doohickey scooter and i i, I tool around on that thing yeah i just like zip around i look like an idiot but you know it's fun i, I like wasting time uh being outside uh yeah you know i like outdoors you know despite you know my job staying inside here you know my new office yeah so, yeah <laughs> yeah i mean because you mentioned that you spend a lot of time in front of a computer all day so is this is this like the uh the you know the pendulum swinging to the other side you got to go outside and do a lot of sports there. i gotta play around you know i gotta play in the mud you know it's like <laughs> uh I, I need a i go out for runs and uh, jogging things like that i gotta stay active yeah, we do a virtual high five on that too. I'm a, I'm a, yeah, uh, right I'm on. Myself, yeah. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> uh, what do you, what do you like to do for fun? Uh, one of the things I try to get down and do is um, I'm part of the Kauai High Paddling Club. Um, so this is the older club that meets at like six, six thirty in the morning. And I haven't done this since uh, the coronavirus time started, but going down there in the mornings and being out on the open water paddling in a six person canoe especially during whale season because you'll have whales that are breaching right next to your canoe and it's really a crazy experience or there was one time where the whales were going under the canoe and you could actually hear their songs coming through the canoe which was insane so that's definitely one of the cooler things i like to do that's so amazing. We can also virtual high five about that because uh, I, I paddle as well, but I have never had an experience like that to feel. I mean, uh, canoe itself, the va is so, so important. And to feel the whale song through it, I can't imagine what that must have felt like. That's it's inspiring experience for sure. Gosh. Wow. Thank you. And Mariella, when you're not skydiving and bobsledding, <laughs> <laughs> what sort of things keep you busy on the island? Oh, my kids. <laughs> so I'm a mom and um, I have two kids. They're seven and nine. So uh, my world outside of work uh, revolves around adventures with them. Um, so keeping them from getting hurt, <laughs> make sure, making sure they get, they get fed um, and having fun with them. You know, I, I, what I love about having uh, kids is that you get to be a kid again yourself. And uh, one of the places that we love to, to go is uh, Kiholo. Uh, we love ca camping out in Kiholo. It's one of our, I, we've had a, quite a few um, family memories out there. Um, and I think that's our special place and our go-to place for um, getting some vitamin C. That's, that's, that's absolutely great. I mean, yeah, I, I have a son. He, uh, he just turned, he's almost 11 months old. He just started walking now. And, you know, I can, I can, I can look at him and just see the wonder in his eyes and everything. And I go like, you know, that's why I'm a scientist, you know, kids, like, I totally get what you mean. You know, kids are looking at everything, like for the first time and want to know more about it. And scientists like me, astronomers like me, we just never grew out of that phase. We're like, Oh, what's that? We've got to figure him out. Right. <laughs> Which I think is a lot of fun. Well, you know, we're getting really close to the hour here. So we're, there's just going to be one last question just very briefly uh, as we wrap up here, uh, which I think is a great question too. Um, what is something that people do not realize that you do as part of your job? What is something that we, we haven't touched on yet? What, what, what do you do that people don't realize? I'm going to give you just a second to think about it. And we're this is going to be the last question. We're going to wrap up on it. Um, Callie, you look ready. Am I right? Yeah. So the one thing that people, I don't think realize that I do is when I'm observing, I'm the only person awake from my observatory. Um, so I'm controlling the whole thing on my own and I have to, if something goes wrong, I'm that first line of defense to make sure that it's not going to get worse. Uh, so I can leave it till the morning or something that I have to call somebody at two or three in the morning to be like, Hey, this is a problem. You need to wake up and fix this now. And so I, I, don't like waking people up like that, but it's a really important part of my job to ensure the safety of the observatory um, so that it can keep running for as long as we can. So, so important. Being on the receiving end of some of those phone calls, I'm really glad that we have experts like you in place that can just solve stuff so I don't have to get up at three in the morning. I really appreciate <laughs> it. And uh, John, how about you? What is something that people don't realize that you do as your part of your job? Um, well, you know, when I think of software engineer, I think of programming and writing code, but a surprising amount of my time is spent reading up on 
you know, on the problem. You know, sometimes I have to read a, like a thesis paper or I have to read a pretty heavy in-depth theory of operation of something in order to write the code for it. So, you know, there's a fair amount of reading, <laughs> reading oh. involved. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, so, so you could take apart the whole telescope, put it back together in a weekend, right? Uh, <laughs> Not quite, but <laughs> maybe, yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. And finally, Mariella, um, what's something that people don't realize that you do? Hmm, I think, um, I think most people think that uh, as a communications officer, uh, most of what I do is uh, work with our with our astronomers um, to write pre press releases and, you know, share it with the media and, you um, and do interviews and, and pitch stories and things like that, which, which is a core element of my job, but actually it's only about, it makes up only about 25% of my scope. Yeah, and the rest is everything that I've talked about before, videography, graphic design, uh, photography, filmmaking, virtual tour, uh, education outreach, or yeah, education outreach, um, community events, event coordination. There's a whole gamut of things within the communication realm, which I am very happy about because otherwise I'd be bored. <laughs> what a great resume, seriously. That sounds like so much fun. I'm, I'm sure it's a very, very difficult work a lot of the time, but I, it looks really rewarding. I mean, that's oh, exciting. it is. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Well, Mahalo Nui so much to all of our panelists for your time and answering questions today. And as an astronomer, on behalf of astronomers, thank you so much for all of you and what you do, because our job is impossible without everything that you're doing. And I'd also like to thank everybody who's working behind the scenes to pass me questions and make sure like videos like this are possible. Uh, and Mahalo, finally, to everybody tuning in today. Thank you so much for stopping by. We hope that you're going to have a super inspiring day. Aloha Friday from here. And uh, ahui ho. See you next time. Mahalo, everyone. Thank you. Take care. See you guys.